you. Welcome to all of you for joining us tonight to this pre-concert lecture. Uh, this lecture is designed to help prepare us for this weekend's concerts by Te Deum, Divine. Uh, to teach us more about the music and the faith behind the music, we're honored to have with us one of the leading experts in the field of Orthodox liturgical music, Dr. Vladimir Morrison. He has his hands in many pots. He's the founder and president of Musica Rusica, a publishing company that specializes in the publication and dissemination of Orthodox choral music throughout the Western world. But in addition, he's the founder and artistic director of uh, Archangel Voices, a professional level choral ensemble with whom he's recorded six CDs of Orthodox liturgical music. He's also the composer and editor of numerous choral arrangements. He serves as the project lead for music editing and online instruction for the Department of Liturgical Music of the Orthodox Church in America. And he serves as director of liturgical singing at St. Catherine Orthodox Mission in Carlsbad, California. Vlad, thank you for being here. This Zoom room is yours. Well, thank you for that introduction. Matthew, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to wish good evening to all of you lovers of beautiful choral music, wherever you may be. So I've been asked to say a few words that would give you some insight into the music you'll be hearing this weekend performed by Tadeum, and thus heighten your appreciation of it, perhaps even change your life a bit. Wouldn't that be a wonderful mm -hmm. thing? The music on the program this weekend, sacred choral music of the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition happens to be my favorite subject. Some 50 years ago, when I was a music major at Occidental College uh, here in Los Angeles, California, I discovered that there was this vast area of choral repertoire called Orthodox sacred music a venerable tradition going back at least a thousand years, and that since I was the son of Russian refugees, this was the music of my ancestors. And so began a lifetime of collecting, studying, performing, and publishing this music, making it accessible to an increasingly larger audience around the world. I have a little chirp uh, in the background. Is that super annoying? I, I'm, I don't know if I can get rid of it. Uh, if you're able to get rid of it, that would be ideal. If not, um, we will manage. It's a piece of equipment that is, okay. Oh, thankfully that wasn't too difficult. <laughs> So Orthodox choral music has risen to world prominence in the last 10 or 15 years. If you've been following such things as Grammy nominations in the category of best choral performance, then you know that since 2007, in the last 15 years, there have been 10 recordings that have been either Grammy winners or nominees that featured Russian Orthodox or Orthodox inspired choral music. Each and every year, leading professional choirs, as well as an array of high school, college, community choirs around the world program Orthodox sacred choral works. And we know that by the orders for sheet music we receive here at our publishing company, Musica Rusica. And with that music, they put on oral concerts, such as the one you'll be hearing this weekend. But such popularity was not always a given. In fact, over the course of the 20th century, the very survival of Russian Orthodox sacred choral music was by no means assured. In the first two decades of the 20th century, there was a tremendous flowering of sacred choral composition in the Russian Empire. Professional choirs, such as the Moscow Synodal Choir, the Imperial Court Capella of St. Petersburg, achieved an incredibly high level of technical perfection, astonishing audiences and music critics who heard them, both at home and in Europe, where they toured. Inspired by the existence of these splendid choral instruments, 
dozens of composers, including such prominent names as Sergei Rachmaninoff, Anatoly Lyadov, Alexander Grichaninov, Viktor Kalinikov, and Pavel Chesnokov, to name just a few, including some of the ones whose work you'll be hearing this uh, on the program, composed thousands of new works and chant arrangements. The last time I counted, there were indeed several thousand works. But in 1917, following the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, catastrophe struck. The atheist communist regime declared all out war upon religion of any kind and the Russian Orthodox Church in particular. The first to go were the professional choirs, the Moscow Synodal Choir, which had sung services in the Kremlin cathedrals, and the Imperial Court Chapel, which was the choir of the royal family. Churches and monasteries were summarily closed, either shuttered, repurposed, or demolished. Thousands upon thousands of clergy and monastics were arrested, sent to the gulag, or even worse, executed by firing squad. Composers and choir masters who had worked in the area of sacred music were given an ultimatum to sever all ties with the church or face dismissal from their teaching positions and other means of earning a living. In 1923, a decree was issued by the communist commissars specifically forbidding the performance of any sacred music, whether Orthodox or Western, in concerts. During the 1930s, at the height of Stalin's reign of terror, only 500 churches remained open in the entire USSR, where before the revolution there had been over 29,000 churches. The communists' war against the church and all religious art would continue for 75 years until the fall of communism in 1991. In 1979, I traveled to the Soviet Union on a Fulbright IREX fellowship to collect materials for my dissertation on the topic choral performance in pre revolutionary Russia. My supervising professor at the Moscow Conservatory, Klavdi Ptitsa, who had been a student of Pavel Chesnokov, happened to be a devout Orthodox believer, although in secret. One day when we were strolling in the halls of the conservatory and discussing my research work, he took on a serious tone. You understand, Vladimir, he said to me, that here in the Soviet Union, we are not able to perform the great sacred choral works of the Orthodox Church. So I charge you, collect everything you can, take it to the West and teach them how this music is to be performed properly so that this legacy isn't lost forever. Of course, he could not foresee, and none of us at that time could foresee that the atheist communist regime in the Soviet Union would fall some 10 years later. And he unfortunately did not live to see that day. He died in 1983. So, here we are in 2022, about to hear a concert entitled Divine by the Tadeum Choir. What you will be hearing is the sacred music of a 2000 year old tradition, that of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And it's a tradition that's still largely unknown in many parts of our country. What is it exactly, and how did it come to be here? Many people in America, including Christians of various denominations, are simply not familiar with Eastern Orthodoxy, or for that matter, with church history. They may or may not know that in post-apostolic times, the centuries following the Edict of Milan in the year 313 AD, which made Christianity legal in the Roman Empire, there were five major patriarchates 
or administrative church structures. Rome, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria. All these churches held to the same beliefs and teachings while having minor variations in church ritual and the type of singing they employed at worship. After the fall and dissolution of the Western Roman Empire in the year 476, the Church of Rome emerged as both a religious and secular unifying power in the lands of Western and Central Europe. But in part as a result of this increasing political power of the Pope of Rome, in the year 1054, the Roman Catholic Church and the four other original Eastern Orthodox patriarchates split in what came to be known as the Great Schism. Well, beyond these sketchy details, the focus of Western Christians' awareness of church history shifts to the rise of Protestantism in England under King Henry VIII and as the various reform movements in continental Europe, led by Martin Luther, John Calvin, and others. Meanwhile, the Eastern Roman Empire, headquartered in Constantinople, continued to flourish for another thousand years. Although it expended a lot of resources fighting the spread of militant, militant Islam throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa, a struggle that ended with the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. When the Protestant reformers attempted to establish communication with the Eastern Church in the 16th century, there were some initially positive exchanges, but none that bore fruit, and thus awareness of Eastern Orthodoxy lapsed into obscurity in the minds of most Western Christians. But even before the great schism of 1054, Christian missionaries had converted numerous tribes and nations of Eastern Europe, the Serbs, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, and the Kievan Rus, the cradle of the civilization that would eventually become Great Russia, Muscovy, Little Russia, Ukraine, and White Russia, Belarus. Kiev and Rus was baptized into Christianity in the year 988 AD by Saint Prince Vladimir of Kiev, who happens to be my patron saint. Orthodoxy first came to the New World through Alaska in the year 1794, when the first Russian missionaries came there and converted many of the native Aleutic and Eskimo people to Christianity. An increased awareness and spread of Eastern Orthodox Christianity in the West can be then traced to the waves of immigrants who came to the New World in ever larger numbers beginning in the 19th century. The first to come were Carpatho Russians, farmers and miners primarily, who were suffering persecution in the Austro-Hungarian Empire of the, in the late 1800s. The next large wave were Russians, many of them aristocrats and intelligentsia who were fleeing for their lives after the communist revolution of 1917 and the Russian Civil War, which lasted until 1922. My wife's family, for example, was among those people. First, they went to Yugoslavia, and then they emigrated to the United States. Many more Orthodox people were displaced by World War II, and finding themselves in Western Europe were either unable or unwilling to return to the Soviet Union because of the continuing horrors of Stalinism, and my family was among them. After the dissolution of the USSR in 1991, emigration from the former Soviet republics became possible, and many more Russians and Ukrainians came to the West for economic opportunity, largely. Parallel with the Eastern Slavs, primarily Russians and Ukrainians, 
Other ethnic groups of Orthodox immigrants came during the 20th century from Greece, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, as well as the Balkan countries, Serbia, Albania, Bulgaria, and Romania. The first thing that all these immigrant groups did in America was establish churches with each group confessing the same Orthodox faith, but each having their own national diocesan organization. This is why one encounters Greek Orthodox, Antiochian Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, as well as Russian Orthodox parishes in North America. They're referred to by different names, but they all hold to the same beliefs and worship practices. In 1970, the original Russian Alaskan mission established in 1794 gained its independent status, becoming known as the Orthodox Church in America, or OCA for short, with the goal of being the local Orthodox Church for North America, and thus having a strong emphasis on the use of English in worship, as well as on missionary outreach. The ideal goal of the OCA is eventually to have a single administratively united Orthodox Church in this country. But this goal remains somewhat elusive as long as the various ethnic ties to old world countries remain strong. Nonetheless, all the various Orthodox churches in this country, all the dioceses and jurisdictions as they're known, share the same theology, the same dogmas, and the same order and manner of worship, even though the worship may occur at times in different languages. Thus, when we speak of Orthodox music, such as you will hear in the upcoming program, one of the first things to bear in mind is that every piece of music, even those that have been composed fairly recently, is deeply rooted in tradition the first of our three T's for tonight. We have tradition, transcendence, and transformation. So tradition represents an unbroken thread of Christian liturgical worship that goes back 2000 years to the time of Christ, the apostles, and the early church fathers. While certain details and specific musical forms and styles have evolved over the centuries, the fundamental traditions have not changed. And these can be expressed as follows. Orthodox worship is purely vocal, allowing no instruments. And as somewhat of a corollary, Orthodox worship is exclusively verbal, drawing extensively upon the Psalms, Old and New Testament canticles, and other words from scripture. And as additional hymns were composed in the course of centuries, these ancient examples were used as models. One of the works you will hear in the concert, Gladsome Light, for example, is mentioned in third and fourth century sources as already being very ancient. So in a similar fashion, composers of new musical settings of these texts followed pre-existing patterns and prototypes, always preserving the organic connection with the past, with tradition. So the composer of the Gladsome Light setting you will hear, the great late Richard Tensing, uses very traditional chant motifs as the basis for the work that he composed in 2011. We can vividly illustrate this continuity of tradition and adherence to patterns by looking at some examples of iconography, where the contemporary artist painting an icon of say, Jesus Christ or the Virgin Mary, or a particular saint, always works from previously used patterns or models, even as they create new renderings of that particular subject. 
And in this way, icons created over a span of many centuries always display common features that connect them to the earliest representations. At this point, I will like to share my screen and just show you several images. Can you see that now? Matthew? It looks good. It looks good. Okay. So here you have a very ancient uh, image of Christ, uh, known as uh, the Christ of Mount Sinai, uh, at uh, in in the Saint Cath uh, the collection of Saint Catherine Monastery of Sinai. And here we have several other. This is Andrei Rublev from 14th century Russia. This is a very contemporary image painted just a few years ago. Here's another one. And this is uh, Christ Pantocrator, or Christ the um, creator of the universe uh, depicted uh, by Viktor Vasnetsov, a uh, late 19th, early 20th century Russian artist. Now a few icons of St. Nicholas. Again, one from Mount Sinai Library. An old Russian icon. A contemporary Greek icon. This one has some ties to America since it's inscribed also in, in both Greek and English. And another contemporary Russian icon. They're very different, but they're very much the same. I think you'll agree. And we could do that same exercise uh, with, with just about any uh, saint or, or biblical event that is depicted in icons. You'll see how uh, subsequent uh, images uh, pay homage to their predecessors. <clears throat> now in music, such continuity is a bit more difficult to demonstrate. Nevertheless, the Orthodox composer approaches his task from a perspective that is very different from that of a contemporary Western composer, whose primary task seems to be, just the way that Western music has developed, uh, the composer seems to ha have his primary task as to create something uniquely original and individualistic, unlike anything that is created before. By contrast, in orthodoxy, adherence to tradition is regarded as a very necessary and desirable quality. All the music you will be hearing in the concert is drawn from different orthodox liturgical services which are occasions for public worship that take place on Sundays or other appointed days. The order, format, and verbal content, that is to say the texts that are sung at these services, are fixed by, you guessed it, tradition. There is no spontaneous improvisation. There is no worship committee that sits down and composes a service for a given day. And there's a very important reason for this, which brings us to the second of our three T's. Orthodox worship without fail aims at transcendence. Its stated intent is not only to transport the assembled worshipers 
out of the humdrum and mundane aspects of daily life, but it actually pursues a much loftier goal. And that is to act here on earth as a mirror of the heavenly angelic worship that from all evidence takes place unceasingly around the throne of God. Now, when you think about that, it's actually quite a bold and daring undertaking. And you will hear in the priest's exclamation before the singing of Our Father in the concert program, the priest says, and count us worthy, O Master, that with boldness and without condemnation, we may dare to call upon thee, our Heavenly Father, and to say, Our Father. In the understanding of the Orthodox Church, we certainly are not worthy by ourselves to do any of this, but only by the grace and mercy of God are we even able to try. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned available evidence concerning the worship that occurs around the throne of glory. Now, what could such evidence possibly consist of? That would be a perfectly understandable question, given our postmodern, secular, materialistic orientation. Well, the Orthodox Church, through its uninterrupted tradition, has been very careful and deliberate to draw upon examples, both in the Old Testament and the New, of numerous mystical experiences and transcendent revelations that have been granted to various individuals. Among the most famous of these, of course, is described in the book of Isaiah, where the prophet recounts what he saw in a vision. And I quote, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And they called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, these last words, quoting the angelic praise, are incorporated verbatim into every single Orthodox divine liturgy. And shortly before that point in the service, the choir initiates the most solemn portion of the liturgy with the words, let us who mystically represent the cherubim and who sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-creating trinity now lay aside all earthly cares. There it is in a nutshell, so to speak, the lofty mission statement of Orthodox worship. First, to mystically represent the angels. Second, to sing the thrice holy hymn. And third, to lay aside all cares and concerns of this worldly existence, and thus enter into another transcendent reality. This happens throughout the world in every Orthodox divine liturgy served throughout the world, not only every Sunday and major feast day, but in some communities such as monasteries and large cathedrals every single day. Now, if I could use an image from science fiction, or, or perhaps uh, it's also applicable to quantum physics. Some portion of humanity gathers phases into the heavenly realm for a certain period of time and then phases back out at the end of the service and rejoins the present day world. There are, as I mentioned, numerous other examples of mystical visions and ecstatic outpourings of prayer that have been incorporated into Orthodox worship. There are, of course, the Old Testament canticles, 
all of them outpourings of mystical prayer, the songs of Miriam, Moses, Habakkuk, Jonah, the three youths in the furnace in Babylon. There's the canticle of Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord, the Magnificat, the words of Saint Simeon, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. There is the vision of Saint Paul, which he describes in the second letter to the Corinthians of being caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, he does not know, but where he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. But these are some of the things that the church from the earliest days has in fact incorporated into its worship. There is also the account of the young boy who in the year 447, during a great earthquake in Constantinople, was transported into the heavenly realms and heard the singing of the thrice holy hymn, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us, which is one of the most often repeated Orthodox prayers. Then finally, there are the revelations of heavenly worship as revealed to St. John the Evangelist and written down in the book of Revelation. As the well-known Orthodox theologian and writer, Father Thomas Hopko has pointed out, and I quote, the book of Revelation, although never read in the Orthodox church at liturgical worship, bears witness to the divine reality, which is the church's own very life. The worship of the church has traditionally, quite consciously, been patterned after the divine and eternal realities revealed in this book. The prayer of the church and its mystical celebration are one with the prayer and celebration of the kingdom of heaven. Thus, in church, with the angels and saints, through Christ, the word and the lamb, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the faithful believers of the assembly of the saved offer perpetual adoration to God the Father Almighty. End quote. So we could say that although the church does not read the book of the Revelation, it in fact embodies the book of Revelation in its worship. So it is that when one enters an Orthodox church or temple, as it is traditionally called, there is no mistaking the fact that one has left the outside world and entered a different reality, a transcendent space. And this is true whether the space is a monumental cathedral or a humble village chapel. Again, I will demonstrate several slides that will show you these things. So here we have the, the prototypical Orthodox cathedral, the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. After which, many, many other Orthodox churches and cathedrals have been patterned throughout history. And here, of course, from this photo and from its current state, it's very difficult to uh, visualize what uh, it truly looked like with iconography and frescoes all over every single inch of space with the icon of Christ that last icon, that image that we saw, uh, this image here, or one very much like it would have been in the central dome. And then here you see very much a pattern, a church in Balam Monastery uh, in, in Russia that's been very much patterned after this.
and Christ the Savior on the blood, as it's called in St. Petersburg. It's an absolutely magnificent church with mosaics covering every square inch of the walls, pillars, columns, ceiling, floors. And it was constructed on the spot where uh, Tsar Alexander II was assassinated. And here, a much more humble rendering of the same vision, the same heavenly vision. Uh, you see at the top there the, the uh, communion of the apostles at the mystical supper and the uh, same rows of icons. There's a whole theology there that, that, that uh, we could explore if we had more time. So these churches uh, are in Russia, uh, and now we go to Alaska. This is a chapel at St. Herman's Seminary uh, in Kodiak, Alaska, where St. Herman of Alaska, the first American Orthodox saint, uh, lived. And another church, here in the United States. This happens to be Holy Virgin Mary Cathedral in Los Angeles, where I grew up and directed the choir on a couple of occasions. I mean, a couple of stretches at a time. I don't mean a couple of like single occasions. Uh, so again, you see the same kind of transcendent space. And uh, the last example is, uh, of this is the cathedral called Joy of All Who Sorrow uh, in San Francisco. As with icons, church architecture can uh, is is much uh, it's much easier to demonstrate. Uh, and visualize the transcendent nature of Orthodox worship spaces. But when it comes to music, how does the music of Orthodox worship or Orthodox liturgy achieve similar transcendence as we saw in the worship spaces of Orthodoxy? Well, the history of Orthodox liturgical music is multidimensional and complex especially when one takes into account the various nationalities and cultures in which it developed over a period of 2000 years. But one overarching principle can be identified. And that is in the Orthodox realm, there has always been an understanding that liturgical singing, chant, whether unison or polyphonic must always be unlike music in the secular or popular sphere. The early church fathers, such as St. Clement of Alexandria and others, drew a very clear line between the singing that took place at Christian worship and the music heard in the theater, for example. Music in the theater used instruments, whereas the Christians from those early times and to this day do not use any instruments, at least in the Orthodox realm. Instruments cannot speak, they cannot utter words, whereas the chant of worship always is intimately connected with the words of prayer. And for this reason, instruments were considered simply that they could not fulfill the proper function of music at worship. In the secular realm, the music of the dance used by pagans possessed and continues to possess a very prominent regular meter, which entices the body to respond with regular physical movements. The chants of worship, on the other hand, derived and continued to be derived they're deriving their rhythm from the words, and thus they typically have a meter that is typically irregular, 
and not associated with any form of bodily movement. One of the best examples of this you will he hear this weekend is in the piece, I Am the True Vine by the Estonian compo Orthodox composer Arvo Pert. The piece consists of blocks and splashes of sound which carry the words from the Gospel of St. John. The time signature changes with almost every measure, but there is no discernible regular meter. And it is for this reason, it is often said that Pert's music possesses the quality of timelessness and otherworldliness, since it seems to exist in a realm beyond our worldly rhythms and regular measurements of time. In terms of the musical style and vocabulary used by composers of Orthodox music, the aesthetic of otherness was perhaps best expressed by the Russian composer Alexander Kostaisky in his 1913 autobiographical article, My Musical Life and My Thoughts About Church Music. And I quote, I should like to have music that can be heard nowhere except in a church and which would be as distinct from secular music as church vestments are from the dress of the laity. And here we have our last screen share. Which shows orthodox vestments. And there's no question that these men are attired uh, not in, uh, th th there's no way of mistaking their vestments for the dress of ordinary lay people going about their business. So the singing by unaccompanied voices, the absence of instrumental music, the total melding of sacred melody with the sacred words, including word-related rhythms, the avoidance of regular dance rhythms, resulting in a sense of timelessness and eternity. All of these are qualities that make musical expression in orthodoxy the music of worship, rather than music at worship, where musical styles, genres, and even actual melodies are oftentimes borrowed from the secular realm and adapted in various ways to the worship services, or put in another way, they accompany the worship service. This latter approach has largely been characteristic of music and its role in Western Christian worship, which also has a very complex history of development and evolution, but along a different path than that of the Orthodox. And now we arrive at the third aspect of our purpose of Orthodox worship and sacred music. And that is transformation. As we mentioned, through its constant grounding in tradition and by its lofty, uncompromised orientation towards transcendence, the purpose and goal of Orthodox liturgy and liturgical music in particular is nothing short of the transformation of reality and of the persons who inhabit it, even for a short time. There's a story preserved in one of the earliest Eastern Slavic historical chronicles about the conversion of Prince Vladimir of Kiev to Christianity. The pagan prince was searching for a new religion for his people. So he sent 10 ambassadors to check out all the religions and forms of worship in neighboring cultures and nations. They investigated Judaism, Islam, Western Christianity, and Eastern Christianity, and then returned back home with their report to the prince. The report is kind of interesting to read in its entirety because it's very flowery and fanciful, but the key statement is here, and I quote, when we went into the Greek lands, 
we were led into a place where they serve their God. And we did not know where we were, in heaven or on earth. And we have no words to describe this. All we know is that God dwells there with people. And their worship service is better than in any other land. We cannot forget that beauty. Just as any person, if he eats something sweet, will not take something bitter afterwards, so we can no longer remain in paganism. Now, this particular transformation was rather sudden and profound, but this account, with its emphasis on the divine worship and the divine beauty of the worship, is one that has captured the imagination of Orthodox creative artists in the lands of Rus in the centuries to follow. And it resonates with Dostoevsky's statement that, quote, beauty will save the world, which was written almost 900 years later. More typically, however, the transformation that takes place in the realm of Orthodox faith and worship is more gradual, incremental, accomplished over a much longer period of time, perhaps even a lifetime. In this realm, every aspect of life is transformed by various means. The Orthodox Church sanctifies material creation with special blessings focused on water, oil, bread, wine, as well as the blessing of honey, fruits, flowers, herbs, and the means of transportation. This is what constitutes a sacramental lifestyle. The recognition that, to quote the Psalms, the earth is the Lord's and all that dwell therein. And that every personal interaction, whether with other people or the inanimate world, constitutes a sacramental interaction with the divine. In the concert this weekend, you will hear a setting of the so-called introductory psalm of Vespers, Psalm 104, which declares, Wondrous are your works, O Lord. In wisdom have you created all things. Time itself is sanctified by numerous cycles of worship and prayer. There is a daily cycle, which begins with Vespers at the setting of the sun and ends with the celebration of the Eucharist the ultimate human expression of gratitude and sacrifice, and which involves that phasing in and out of heavenly worship that we already mentioned. There is a weekly cycle that commemorates crucial events and personages in salvation history, chief among them, the resurrection of Christ, which is celebrated every Sunday. There is a yearly cycle with every single day having numerous commemorations of saints, many of them mar martyrs who are the superheroes of the Orthodox Christian faith. And in all of these cycles, the emphasis is not on novelty, originality, or innovation, but rather on tradition, familiarity, and repetition, a process by which the consciousness and psyche of each person present is gently but ever so persistently shaped and formed into a new creation, a person who is ever increasingly aligned with the mind of God. We've already seen how the physical environment in an Orthodox temple is an embodiment of beauty, quite unlike anything in the day-to-day -day world. Certainly there is a great deal of appeal to the sense of vision, Add to that the fragrant incense, which appeals to the sense of smell, the euphonious singing, which appeals to the sense of hearing, the bows and prostrations, which involve the entire body, coupled with the frequently repeated litany responses, such as Lord have mercy. You'll hear an example of this in the concert. And thus you begin to see how Orthodox liturgy and worship are intended 
and designed to affect and transform the total human being, body, mind, heart, and spirit, by bathing it in a multi-sensory experience of divine beauty. So my intent tonight was to give you just a small intimation of what to expect at Todayum's concert this coming weekend. In the light of what I have said, you may get the sense that taking Orthodox sacred music out of its liturgical context and preserve, presenting it in a concert setting is perhaps somewhat counterintuitive. Nonetheless, such occasions expose a wide circle of people to the Orthodox faith who may otherwise not come into contact with it. And the phenomenon of Orthodox sacred concerts has been in existence for some 150 years in various countries. And so in a sense, it's been blessed by tradition. So this weekend, as you listen, not only with your ears, but also with your heart, you may find yourself transported to some transcendent space. And like St. Vladimir's envoys, you just may also wonder if you are in heaven or on earth. And I thank you for your attention this evening. And now we have some time for a few questions. Vladimir, thank you so much. Um, it's with it's with sort of humility and excitement that Tedeum and I uh, sing this music this weekend, and then to hear you speak uh, so eloquently and passionately about that tradition, that long tradition, um, it, it almost feels appropriate to say about which we're going to be a part of that tradition, but that we're going to try to honor that tradition for our our ninety minute concert this weekend. Uh, you thank you for making that even more exciting for us. Um, for all of you here, um, if you have some questions, uh, we have uh, Dr. Morrison has agreed to stay around for 10 or 15 more minutes and answer some questions. Please drop those in the chat and I will I'll sort of uh, read those out. Uh, and while you're thinking up what your questions are and adding those in the chat, I'd love to, to start with one, uh, Dr. Morrison. It's pretty basic, but uh, I wondered if you, and you, you hit on this a little bit, I wonder if you could just expand a little bit more in this concert, we are singing selections from Vespers, selections from the Divine Liturgy, selections from a priest, a couple of selections from pre-sanctified liturgy. Could you just expand for us a little bit more? What are those Vespers, Divine Liturgy, pre-sanctified liturgy? Right. Well, as I mentioned, Vespers uh, is the start of the liturgical day, and in the evening, and um, in a, it. it the Vesper service, which in many contexts is followed also by, by the Matin service. Uh, we, we, many, many music lovers know of the Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil, which is a setting of the Vespers, hymns, and Matins. And taken together and separately, those services have a kind of, um, kind of trajectory, if you will. Uh, they start with the psalm of creation, as I mentioned, bless the Lord of my soul, uh, and, and it sings about, oh Lord, my God, thou art very great, uh, you've created all these things. Um, and then we start already uh, anticipating the, uh, well, there, there is mention of an acknowledgement of the fall, the fall after that initial creation. And uh, there is a set of penitential psalms uh, accompanied with, with, well, a lot of different texts uh, uh, that change from, from day to day, but, but they usher in gladsome light, which is the coming of uh, the light, uh, the, the light being Christ. There's a gladsome light of the holy glory of the heavenly Father, O oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so there's uh, the anticipation uh, that Christ has come into the world. Uh, Vespers continues and ends with the canticle of St. Simeon. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which you have prepared. So Simeon has encountered the infant Christ in the temple, 
and sings or speaks uh, praise. However, uh, uh, you'll hear a setting by by Nicholas Reeves of this of this so uh, venerable hymn, very ancient, of course, going back to the Gospel of Luke. Um, and so, so each of these services has a kind of of you might say didactic um, trajectory that takes us from the initial creation through the fall, through the redemptive appearance of Christ. Uh, and then uh, the Matins, uh, it talks a lot about the resurrection of Christ. And, and that ushers in the celebration of the divine liturgy. A divine liturgy itself is a series of psalms, prayers, uh, and hymns that um, has its own trajectory. There, there is the, the entrance with the gospel, the first appearance of Christ uh, in, in the world to the, to the, to the people when, when uh, St. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God. Uh, and, and then, uh, guess what? The Lamb of God, or as initially as the bread and wine that is going to become the Eucharist, is brought in at the great entrance uh, during the singing of the Cherubic Hymn. Then there's the Confession of Faith, the Nicene Creed, uh, the Consecration of the, of the Gifts, the Lord's Prayer, and uh, Holy Communion. And so again, there's this, this cycle that repeats every time a divine liturgy is, is uh, celebrated. And I hope that kind of answers uh, the question a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for, for taking that a little bit deeper. It's clear that uh, what you're sharing with us right now is still just sort of scratching the surface. Uh, we scratch this a little bit, and it's, 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 it's pretty clear how much more information you have there. Um, you, were, you were obviously very thorough in your lecture because uh, no one seems to have any extra <laughs> questions. Uh, so uh, given that, I'm going to be selfish and ask another one that came to mind for myself. Uh, something we've taught, you showed us many of, and we've talked about a lot, are icons. Yes. And I will say, whenever I see an icon, I, I can always tell it's an icon. But I'm wondering, but I, but I also couldn't tell you what makes that an icon and not just a painting of Jesus. What right. makes that not just a piece of art of Mary? Can you, can you illuminate us a little bit? What are those elements that make an icon an icon and not just a piece of art? Yes, well, I am not an iconographer, but I have been, uh, let, let me just uh, screen share again and maybe we can look at some of those, uh, some of those images again. Um, let's see. Do this right. So here, here is one of the most ancient uh, re representations of of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Um, what makes it an icon and not just a painting? Well, certainly, uh, it's one of the things that that should be mentioned is that is this element of what's called reverse perspective mm -hmm. and it has to do with uh, the point of view uh, of the icon or the person depicted in the icon and the viewer um, in a typical western painting with uh, where the rules of perspective are observed the point of view is the viewer and points in the painting uh, either are closer or they recede depending on the point of view of the viewer. In, a, in an Orthodox icon, somehow, and, I, and again, I can't explain this technically, but uh, the perspective is reversed and the icon is looking at you from its point of view. And you sense that by seeing that the, the face of Christ is not per portrayed exactly in a realistic way. In other words, there's, there's more to the sides of his head and the ears than one would normally see, like looking at, 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 at 
your image or my image on, on, the, on the screen. Now, this particular image, it, moreover, is, is very, very famous for, for a reason. If you look at carefully at not just the eyes, but also the, the two parts of the right and the left face, they are different. They are not identical. And that's not because the painter was <laughs> somehow uh, uh, technically uh, in, 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 deficient or, 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 you know, and didn't know how to make those two uh, faces, uh, parts of the face symmetrical. On the contrary, it's trying to express this extraordinarily important uh, belief that Jesus was both human and divine at the same time. And so you have uh, a to like two different emotions expressed. There's the, uh, the loving savior on the one hand, the compassionate, merciful savior, and on the other hand, the, the strict and righteous judge. Uh, so that is kind of behind, uh, the, the, uh, behind this particular image. Now, the other interesting thing, and, and, and every image, if you, if you look at this image by uh, 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 the, the very famous Andrei Rublev, the same thing. The, the eyes are not identical. They're looking at you differently. Um, this modern uh, rendering is, is very modern. At the same time, it, it contains some, some of the same elements uh, of, of both these previous two. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's uncanny. And then there's this very interesting icon, which is called Not Made by Hands. And it looks at Christ's face depicted on what looks like a towel. And this, uh, there's, a, there's a story in one of the uh, very early apocryphal gospels about the, the king who uh, was suffered leprosy. And uh, he sent his servant to ask uh, Jesus to come and heal him. And Jesus said, well, I, I can't because I have my mission here in, in, the, in, uh, in Israel. Uh, but he took a towel and wiped his face and sent that towel with the servant back to the king who was suffering leprosy. And when the king washed and wiped himself with that, with that towel, his leprosy was healed, but also this image of Christ was indelibly imprinted upon the towel. And Again, we, we it's it's almost like 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 a cell like a photograph uh, that, that somehow Christ's divine energy imprinted itself. It's like the shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. There's this image, which again, there's some some debate and controversy over that. But but it, you know, if you've ever seen it, there's a similarity there too of that image of the face in the shroud of Turin and and the this this image not made by hands. And, and many others like it. Uh, so you can almost, you, you can see there's a prototype and, 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 you know, in other words, you're looking at, at different photographs of the same person, as it were, or different, different depictions of the same person. There's a, there's a commonality. Um, let's see. So that's I, I, a couple yeah, of I things think that about makes... icons that, that, uh, yeah. that, uh, you know that it's not they're not realistic paintings they, they don't try to uh, but they try to capture well even here of Saint Saint Nicholas uh, some aspect some aspect of his person but his uh, transformed person that person that has been who has spent a lifetime walking with God as it were and that that worshiping the Orthodox liturgy and celebrating the Orthodox Eucharist, uh, and, and somehow he's been reshaped into a, a being that, that, that is somehow uh, transcendent. He's, he's, uh, he's still Nicholas, the Bishop of Myra, uh, but <laughs> he's definitely not Santa Claus, <laughs> although, although the beard is kind of curly. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> and, and, there, and there you have the red vestments with, uh, you know, with the first with the crosses on them. Um, you know, there, there's a very uh, interesting reconstruction that they did uh, of, of, I believe they, they, they took the skull of the, the relics of St. Nicholas and the modern uh, uh, artists, uh, sculptors, uh, reconstructed the face that would have been on top of those bones. And he came up with someone who looks remarkably like St. Nicholas and the icons. Yeah, if you, if you Google, there's a whole website devoted to St. Nicholas that has all kinds of stories, legends, uh, facts, fact, fictions, and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that you can read about that, that how, how, they, how they did that. So it's, it's very interesting. That's great. That's a really helpful way to understand that, um, those different elements you shared. And I think especially the perspective, that idea that the painting is not about us looking at the saint, it's about the saint looking back at us. Um, it's it's from their perspective rather than our viewing perspective. We would certainly never see an icon where the saint is bending over and doing something, right? They're always they're always straight on looking straight at us like that. Um, that's most really humble. Yeah, most yeah. of the most of the time, there are of course um, uh, icons of, of of various feasts, various biblical events. Um, the the baptism of Christ in the Jordan River. Okay. Um, the the crucifixion. Uh, the uh, um, interestingly, icons of the resurrection in in Orthodox tradition don't ever show, or at least they're not supposed to show. Uh, you know, uh, Christ rolling back the stone and and kind of emerging from the sepulcher and and zapping the guards into into some sort of uh, unconscious stupor. Uh, no, they, they, because no one, no was, no one was there. No one saw that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but what what Christ is shown as descent, it's called the descent, descent into Hades or the harrowing of of Hades, where Christ is shown uh, in the underworld, standing on a cross shaped depiction of the gates of Hades, which he broke. And he's drawing Adam and Eve and the righteous uh, souls who, who dwelt there from the beginning of, well, throughout the Old Testament, he is pulling Adam and Eve by, out by the hand, which mm. of course is the whole purpose of his coming uh, into, into the world to, to, uh, to, to rescue, as it were, rescue um, humanity. Uh, from who were before his coming and those who are in after his coming so that's 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 excellent thank you um let's conclude there's one uh really good question about inclusivity in the chat that we'd love for you to speak to uh the question is do choirs in the orthodox church include women well historically uh yes and no, in the sense that uh, for for a while, I mean, in in monastic settings, for example, in a convent, you'd have a choir of women, of course. Uh, in a monastery, you'd have a choir of men. Uh, in cathedrals in in uh, Russia, uh, for a number of centuries, there were choirs of men and boys. Uh, that kind of gets into the whole history of polyphony and and uh, uh, but 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 it. There has never been any kind of, of, of canonical prohibition against women singing. And then uh, in the late 19th century, the uh, composer and choir master Alexander Arhangusky in St. Petersburg uh, formally integrated women's voices uh, into, into church choirs. Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, because I think he, he got tired of training generation after generation of, of choir boys, you yeah. know. <laughs> so he said, "Well, let's let's just have women." Uh, but but it was interesting that that uh, in an Orthodox church, in a traditional Orthodox church, again, not by any kind of um, uh, injunction or, or or prohibition, but but there was a custom of of men standing on one side of the church and women standing on the other side of the church. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the men would stand on the right side of the church as you face the, the front, uh, where the, uh, the side of Christ, where that's where Christ's big icon is. And the women would stand on the side of, of where Mary's icon is, on the left side. So, um, and it was not considered inappropriate for men and women to stand in close proximity to each other, which of course they would have to if they were in a choir. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that was largely, it was kind of a practical, it was a pious custom that, you know, well, we shouldn't do that, but, but there was no real, uh, yeah, it, there, there's absolutely uh, a sense of inclusivity in that, in that regard. And, would it be uh, would it be an accurate statement to say that the repertoire Te Deum is doing this weekend was intended for female voices rather than boys voices um, when it was composed, or was some of it probably for boys, men and boys? Yeah, well, it, 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 the composers of the the Moscow Sonata Choir, for example, uh, they wrote for with that with that instrument in mind. Um, so Rachmaninoff and Kalinikov. Uh, for example, Kostaisky, uh, th there was a, actually a poll taken of, of those composers and, and different composers uh, favored different kinds of sound. Um, so they might have writ been written for uh, uh, a mixed, uh, I mean, a choir of men and boys, whereas of course all your contemporary composers uh, uh, you know, Arvo Pert and, mm -hmm. and Benedict Sheehan and Kurt Sander and Nic Nicholas Reeves, they're all writing for, uh, probably for, for a uh, mixed choir of, of women and men. Uh, Bortnjanski, Bortnjanski probably was uh, of, a, of an era, in an era where, uh, where boys, it was choirs of men and boys. The Imperial Chapel was a choir of men and boys. Uh, although Bortnjanski wrote uh, Italian opera and so clearly knew the women, the, the female voice and how to write for it. Right. But uh, that particular piece, that trio that you're performing, uh, uh, Let My Prayer Arise, would have probably been sung by a, by a trio of, of boys. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But that synodal choir was with female voices. No, the synodal choir also was men and boys. Also men and boys. Okay. Okay. Um, there was one more question thrown into the chat that I think would be a good way to go out. Um, I think that there's probably a very long answer to this question and maybe a shorter answer to this question. And it is, you use the terms Eastern, Eastern Orthodox and Russian Orthodox. Are these synonymous? What are the, are there differences? Are they the same thing? Uh, well, uh, yes, they, they are. Uh, I can answer it. I, I, I talked about the different uh, ethnic uh, the different lands where where mm -hmm. uh, uh, Orthodox Christianity uh, kind of was was first nurtured, uh, of course, in the in the Greco Roman world of the Mediterranean, um, and and then spreading out into the Baltic and and the Eastern Slavic countries of, of Ukraine, Ru uh, Russia. Uh, so uh, so all these different ethnic groups are collectively known as Eastern Orthodox. All Russians are Eastern Orthodox, but not all Eastern Orthodox are Russians. Okay. Okay, that's, that's one way of it. So you have Serbian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, uh, Albanian Orthodox, Romanian Orthodox, and, and numerous. And now you have American Orthodox because you have... Uh, uh, generations now of people who have been born in this country who speak no foreign language other than English uh, in their worship and they are uh, and there is uh, the, the Orthodox Church in America for example that, 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 that officially sort of claims that to be the, the local church uh, in, in, in America and so that uh, so American Orthodox in a, in a somewhat paradoxical way are also Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Thank you for that. We may need um, to revise that terminology at some point. I, it, it might, it might, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll put together a council for it. Yeah. Um, Dr. Morrison, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, your many years of scholarship. Uh, I appreciate that very much. 
Uh, and for our audience who's here with us tonight, thank you for joining us. Uh, please tell your friends that uh, how, how much how much wisdom was available here. We are going to make this uh, tonight's lecture available on YouTube, so the future ticket purchasers will be able to get a receive a link to to learn the things that you got to learn tonight. And I look forward to seeing all of you at one of our two performances this weekend. Thank you all very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Enjoy the concert. <laughs>